and welcome everyone here to uh, yet another uh, session in our CAPTCHA, in, excuse me, uh, CAPTURE This of Creative Tech Week at Art Center College of Design. Um, for those of you who don't know, which is hard for me to believe at this point, that I'm Gloria Kondrup and I'm the Executive Director of the Hoffman's Milken Center for Typography. Um, uh, CAPTURE This is a multi-platform program that studies uh, linguistic trends born uh, within digital communication platforms and the transformative effect of emergent technologies and our use of languages and what these occurrences reveal about our future of communication. And obviously, um, it really extends how we think about the, uh, the creation and use of languages and, of course, emojis have become a huge part of this communication process um, every day for all of us. So I'd like to introduce, though, I am going to disappear soon. And I'm going to let Robbie Nock, who's Director of Entrepreneurship and Professional Practice, take over and be the host and moderator of our wonderful guest, Jennifer Aitley. But I will disappear and I will return at the end to perhaps help with some questioning. But thank you, Robbie. And thank you, Jennifer. And thank you, everyone, for attending. I am so looking forward to this and, and, um, and will fully enjoy your presentation. So thank you, Robbie. Thank you, Jennifer. I'm going to disappear now. Thank you, Gloria. And hello, everyone. So pleased to be here today with Jennifer Lee. She's uh, an incredible person friend, collaborator, visionary at the intersection of a huge number of contemporary um, questions around technology, communication, publishing, literacy, uh, translation, and, and, and the, the way that all of that comes together in and through our use of, of technology and language. So um, I, I just give a, a little bit of Jennifer's background here so you can get the sense of the breadth of what she uh, works on and is up to. She's the CEO of Plimpton, which is a literary studio that focuses on digital publishing and innovations within digital publishing. She's the co-founder of the Credibility Coalition, which is a grassroots interdisciplinary group to create better standards for online content and uh, fact checking. She's the co-chair of the Media Entertainment Global Futures Council for the World Economic Forum. She's the producer of uh, a recent um, movie called The Emoji Story, which she'll share more about today. She's the vice chair of the Emoji Subcommittee for the Unicode Consortium and the founder of Emoji Nation, which really is a, a key component to what we're going to be uh, discussing today. So um, Jennifer, thank you for being here and um, so excited for what you, you're going to share. So Jennifer will share some uh, an overview of her work and the way that emojis come to be in our phones and what that means about design and technology and creativity. And then we'll we'll do a, a little bit of uh, planned question and answers, and then we'll have time for audience uh, questions at the end as well. So um, with that, Jennifer, I'll kick it off over to you. And Okay. Can you guys see the screen? Does it, does it look does it look like a bunch of fists with imagination? Have I done the share right? Yes, I think so. Are people yes, chatting? Yes, looks looks yes. great. Full full screen. Perfect. Okay, full screen. All right. So I'm gonna um, basically answer the question. So where where the emoji come from? Where how did they end up on your phone? Like suddenly they went from like nothing to this explosive like cultural phenomenon within a period of like ten years. Um, so the short answer is emoji are regulated by an organization called the Unicode Consortium. And as a matter of fact, I'm actually at the annual. A conference um, in Santa Clara right now. You know, I'm going to go downstairs, and there's going to be lots of engineers talking about um, typography and you know internationalization and emoji. So, what is the Unicode Consortium? Nonprofit group based in Mountain View, California, which mostly has members that are large U.S. multinational tech companies. 
So those include places like Netflix, IBM, Microsoft, Google, Adobe, Apple, Facebook, and Salesforce. Those are fairly neat. Uh, of the ones that are generally not multi, you know, full, that are not um, multinational tech companies, um, you have a German company called SAP. And then you also have the government of Oman, which has been like a big stalwart kind of supporter of um, Unico for a long time. These full members pay $21,000 a year, um, which is a lot of money, but there's sort of like an interesting little loophole, which is like, you know, they, they have full voting uh, rights, but as an individual, you can join for $75. <laughs> you have no voting kind of rights, but you can be on the email list. You can be on um, the, I guess, in, in theory, you have the ability to attend the, the quarterly meetings and, you know, you can like sign up on Unicode's website for $75. Um, and I did that one year, uh, a long time ago, when I was very uh, distraught about uh, the fact that there was no dumpling emoji. This was in 2015. And I was like, how could this be? You know, given how universal dumplings are and how um, universal like emoji, emoji are, right? Because like the dumplings, you have empanada, ravioli, um, uh, you know, uh, cancali, you have like pierogies, but basically every culture has their equivalent of like yummy goodness inside a carbohydrate shell, whether baked, steamed, or fried. And the fact that there was no dumpling emoji let me know that the, like the mission, like whatever was in place had failed. The system was, in, was failed. So I signed up, you know, Google went to the Unicode site and signed up. And then they, well, there was an email list that said, hey, we're going to have a quarterly meeting. And I was like, I looked at the address. I was like, I'm going to be in the Bay Area at that time. They took public transit and showed up at Apple to figure out, okay, how are we going to fight for the something emoji that we're going to fight for? And so this is basically the room where it happened. So I showed up in this room in like November of, uh, or maybe October of 2015. And these are the people who um, designed emoji. You know, these are at that point emoji decision makers. And I was kind of very like, um, it was like, huh, this doesn't seem like the most representative kind of group to make decisions on behalf of a global, you know, visual representative language. I mean, they have a good sense of humor about it. One man's daughter actually made him a, a shirt as a shadowy emoji overlord. This is um, the president of Unicode. So I was like, oh my God, can, you know, <laughs> what can we do about this? Uh, can we get the voice of the people into emoji? And um, so just in terms of giving you a sense of how the emoji decision making, making is made, um, it's actually fairly complex, but the nice thing is anyone can submit a proposal. Like you guys, like any any individual, um, you see that you, you email document at unicode.org with your proposal. Uh, now there's a Google form, which kind of like freshened up. Um, and so like, how does an emoji come to be? So first, you, know, you come up with your idea, you write a proposal. There's a whole bunch of like detailed requirements um, around like how to write a, an emoji proposal and what, you know, what stats and figures you have to show. Then it gets kicked to the subcommittee. Uh, so it's the Unicode Emoji Subcommittee. And um, they may have some feedback. They might like not like it, but if they have feedback, they'll kick it back to you for some adjustments. And then it goes back to you and it kind of goes around the circle and start, you know, until the Emoji uh, Subcommittee feels like it can kick it out to um, the larger full Unicode technical committee. Um, so what are some of the factors for inclusion for an emoji? Uh, there are many. So one is, you know, is it is there popular demand? Is it frequently requested? Do they think there is going to be use for this emoji? Um, a, another plus is whether or not there are multiple uses for meanings. So, you know, like for example, like a Phoenix emoji, which is not currently exist, but, you know, there's both like the bird Phoenix, which is, you know, sort of a, a fictional legendary bird, but it also has the meaning of rebirth. So they like things that even though they have literal meanings, they also have sort of um, larger like cultural meanings. Here's a key thing. It has to be visually distinctive and it can be recognized at emoji sizes. So it turns out emoji are very, very small. So um, making things that are visible and understandable at that size is really tricky. So there's some things, for example, that you know I think could be an emoji, but we just, just couldn't make it work. So one is caves. Like I think a cave for so many different reasons has sort of like emoji meaning, but at emoji sizes, it's actually really hard to draw. So cave has not sort of made it over the emoji um, like bump. Um, another thing is if it's filling a gap, uh, this one's kind of harder and harder over time because many gaps have been filled. But like for an example, of that is for a while, you know, they had red heart, yellow heart, green heart, blue heart, purple heart, black, white, I think, but no, no orange, no orange heart. So some guy was like, my rainbow of hearts is flawed. You know, like what's happening? He proposed an orange heart and for many reasons, obviously, that uh, completed the set. 
there are a lot of factors for actually exclusion or against inclusion, as we say. So one is like, it's too specific or too narrow. Um, you know, this will come times come in like certain animals, like they want, um, you know, uh, a specific kind of dinosaur. You know, now we have two dinosaurs, we have bron the brontosaurus or, you know, whatever the, the, um, <laughs> the popular name for bron brontosaurus is today. And then also a T-Rex, but like, should we also have a triceratops? You know, should we also have a stegosaurus? Um, those are somewhat tricky when you're getting more and more narrow. Um, redundant is a is an issue. So here, an example would be um, one year Butterball wanted a roasted turkey, but we already have um, a live kind of turkey, and so it was considered redundant to have um, to sort of have have that. And uh, it's not visually discernible. Again, this is like my uh, cave problem. Kimchi also kind of struggles with this. I think it's a very culturally important and distinctive and like says a lot of things, but it's, it's really hard to draw in emoji sizes. And then here's something that's really key. There are no logos, brands, you know, deities or celebrities. So that means like no Nike swishes, no gods, you know, no, um, no um, Donald Trump emoji. Like some people are always like, oh, you should have a Donald Trump emoji. No, no recognizable demon. So once it gets out of subcommittee and it goes to the full committee, the full Unicode Technical Media Committee meets uh, three times a year and they vote on various things. Um, sometimes we used to do it quarterly. Now there's sort of like this one big annual push that um, gets the emoji out the door. Um, actually, we just had it last week. So if you look very carefully on the Unicode site, you will you will actually be able to see before it's public, like officially publicized, what the next 22 emoji that will be arriving in 2022 are. So there's a bunch of voting um, and it, it, you know, quarterly they vote and then annually they vote, there's a bunch of voting all the time. Or, and oftentimes they're actually not doing hard voting and done by consensus. But um, it takes, and then after more time, it actually ends up on your devices. So that is how long it takes. All of a sudden it takes about 18 to 24 months doing when you have your idea and when you see it on your device, which is a very long time. So, you know, one of the things is like the history of emoji, like how did we end up here? Such as these little like, you know, colorful glyphs <laughs> are all the rage. So um, the first company that kind of popularized color emoji is recognized by Docomo, which is a Japanese telecom company. They released a set in 1999. You'll see, if you look very closely, you'll see some of these like 12 by 12, um, in, you know, kind of pixel images have actually kind of like descended all the way down to modern day, including like the year and then like, you know, the, this thing and a lot of the smiley faces, um, even sort of the scream. Um, these are actually now collected in MoMA, which I think is, is amazing as a recognition of like the significance they've had in, um, in, in like, you know, design culture. Um, so what happened uh, was the Japanese, um, you know, all the different devices had, um, the carriers had their own different sets of like little digital pictures. So, you know, SoftBank had a set, Docomo had that. So if you were on, it was, it's basically like if you were on like um, different carriers, like if you were T-Mobile versus uh, AT&T, you, you could send to people who also had T-Mobile and also had AT&T, um, but you wouldn't be able to send across. Um, like <laughs> different phone carriers. That's, that's in part because back then, uh, you know, the devices were much more hard, hard coupled to the actual um, telecom company, like less so now. But as as all of those um, kind of things evolved, what happened was they had different non compatible sets. Then you had Apple and Google wanting to work in Japan, and then realizing that people, as people moved into email, they expected that their text kind of characters of these glyphs would also kind of like translate into email. But that wasn't the case because like you want to be in your guys area and then your your emoji would basically disappear so one little kind of legacy of that um or not legacy but sort of an adjacent issue sometimes you'll be emailing with someone like with microsoft who's on microsoft um and there'll just be this errant little capital j at the end of the email and you're always like huh what is that and what that is um, it's sort of similar, which is that the in a certain font in within the Microsoft universe, the smiley face um, is mapped to a capital J on a certain font. So if you don't have that font, it, it bumps it back to a capital J. So like 
they'll see a smiley face when they're in their kind of Microsoft world, and then you will see a capital J. So similar things are happening here. Um, you had um, basically, you know, kind of these texts going, once they went into email, they, 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 they just become top labels. So the SOS happened about 2007 when, you know, Google and Apple were like, we need to sort of consolidate and unify all this. So they went to the Unicode Consortium, which is very good at standardizing things. The Unicode's mission is to enable everyone speaking every language on earth to be able to use their language um, on a computer and smartphone. And they really see this as a human rights issue because like over time, if you cannot like digitally preserve or kind of transmit your language, essentially it, it will die out. So they spend a lot of time getting to the smaller and smaller languages, you know, some of which have very few speakers, um, some of which are mostly academic. So um, to give you some context, Unicode has three main projects, it encodes characters, it creates a lot of localization resources. So for example, knowing that like in China, the currency is going to be, you know, RMB, RMB, and that their time stamps are done a certain way or dates are done a certain way. So there's just libraries for all the different kind of countries around the world. Um, and then they also create the programming libraries that kind of help, that helps you do it. So that you're not as a programmer designer you're looking from scratch. So from 2007 to 2010, they spent a lot of time basically encoding emoji. This is um, the Apple version of the first set that was um, kind of published in 2010 called the Unicode 6.0. And then uh, it then hit the phone in 2011. And originally just the Japanese kind of operating systems, but essentially people had discovered these emoji and then forced um, kind of found tricks to, even if you weren't in a Japanese uh, kind of language setting, you could like force these emoji to show up. So you can see like where it hits Apple and then just kind of explodes uh, over time. Um, so we created a group called Emoji Nation as part of like our journey and you know, the, the motto is Emoji by the people for the people. And it aims to get you know, the voice of the people in the room, now the Zoom uh, around emoji deliberation. Um, you know, and one of the ones that we've uh, kind of pushed is the C job emoji, which was led by a then a 15 year old girl named Ruf al Humaidi, who is Saudi Arabian, but um, is in Germany. Um, those are the different versions of the, you know, what she proposed and what it eventually became. We also worked with, uh, um, with Tinder, very oddly, to create an interracial couple emoji, which should be now on your devices. Um, that was actually really hard because we had to like also propose, like, how do you enter it? Like that, you know, there was long press that did one skin tone, but then suddenly, like, how do you allow two skin tones? Um, and when we have a big documentary called The Emoji Story that if, you know, we can happily make available um, for classes or for students or for like a, you know, a shared viewing for your, for your, um, for the students and the faculty. And um, the nice thing, I think one of the more exciting things is both the hijab emoji and the interracial couple emoji were collected by the Smithsonian Cooper Hewitt Design Museum last year. What year are we in? 2021? Uh, in 2020. In 2020, so that happened and that was very exciting because now it's really nice to see that these aspects of um, digital culture are being, you know, kind of recognized by our premier um, institutions. That is me. So I think I can stop. If I stop share, ta -da. And then it's me and Robbie. So that I think that that's my, you know, <laughs> that's my initial, you know, uh, start. If you have questions, also feel free to put them into the ch to chat. But Robbie also has a bunch of questions. I think. Thank you for that. That was absolutely so <laughs> eye opening for for I think what is going on behind the scenes mm -hmm. with the visual representation of uh, emoji in our, in our lives and in our, in our languages. And I guess one thing that I think would be really interesting to hear your thoughts on to begin with is how does the cultural use of emoji really impact the way that the Unicode consortium and the, the set of partners and collaborators that have been essential in building the, essentially the library, how, yeah. what are they looking at? What, mm. what are they paying attention to? Um, I do think we are, um, we do tend to be sensitive to ways that emoji can be used in a very broad perspective. So here's an example, <laughs> uh, 
as we all know, the eggplant emoji has certain kind of anatomical connotations, um, and then also the peach emoji over time. And actually a very fun kind of thing was um, at a certain point, maybe in like 2017 or so, maybe 2016, Apple redesigned its peach emoji to be a little bit less luscious. And this is in the beta version and, and it was released. And like, there was just a sort of like uproar culturally, <laughs> like on Twitter and like, you know, now you've taken the peach, you know, the, the peachiness out of the peach. Um, and so I've never seen this back in, until then. They rolled back that update to the peach. So they kept it in a sort of like um, luscious state. The, um, you know, there, there's certain things that we're, we, we want to, we're just kind of sensitive. So there was eggplant emoji. If you notice, um, Apple actually has a cucumber emoji, but it is sliced. So it can't, it can't also have a sort of a phallic kind of connotation. Um, there, there have been at different points proposals for a sausage emoji. And also because of concerns about, you know, of, of that, of, you know, sometimes maybe being used in a sort of harassing way, the idea is like, maybe do you do also, do you slice the sausage? do you have multiple sausages sort of like tied together so that you know <clears throat> it can be um just more contained in its in its uh in its sense and one of the more interesting debates of late was i had actually proposed a, a rope emoji just as part of my like settlers of Catan kind of um kind of uh push with you know rock and wood and tree and oh sorry rock wood and stone rock wood and brick those were, we, we did a bunch of those. So like rope seemed like a natural kind of emoji to like move on to, but there was a lot of sensitivity, um, which is interesting because these are the same companies like, you know, the Google, Facebook, uh, Apple, um, who may not be as sort of prescriptive in some of their um, regulation on social media or hate speech or anything like that, but they were very sensitive about the idea that the rope could be used to threaten people for the, the meaning of like lynching, for example. And I is very specifically American. I think maybe it also it might have some connotation in other parts of the world, but we went back and forth on like, how do you design a rope emoji that doesn't have that connotation? And so we basically ended up, you know, we wanted a knot, but we didn't want a knot that was threatening. And so if you net look now, um, the rope uh, emoji has become a knot, but it's a square knot, it's like a sailing knot, it's a non-threatening knot. And that was also part, uh, you know, part of the sensitivity in terms of how the rest of the world would um, see it. And there are like little examples here and there in terms of sometimes thinking that, you know, this emoji will be really popular for certain groups because they, it has, you know, a, a secondary association. I can't think of one right now um, that pops into mind because there have been so many, um, you know, like whether or not sometimes animals being popular for, for sports reasons, um, or um, certain, you know, fruits or foods or whatnot. So they, you know, they are people and they are part of popular culture. They skew American. Um, you know, there's obviously also an, an emoji that, you know, I think many people would think was a mistake now, but did not actually come from Unicode, but came from another um, part of this tech standard organization called the International Standards Organization. They're the ones that did the, um, uh, or someone on that committee did the, the Vulcan hand, which we think is a <laughs> now looking back a terrible emoji. And then they also did the middle finger finger extended emoji. So that was um, that was you know uh, not coming from the large <laughs> major companies, but rather from someone who thought you know quite rightly that that is a, a in, important cultural hand gesture, whether or not you know, it should be encoded, we can debate, but, you know, it's definitely recognizable and has a lot of meaning. So it, it hits a lot of the criteria that we would normally consider for having emoji. So I can keep on going, but I feel like there are, there are so many good No, that's, <laughs> that is just, it's so interesting. And I think maybe you could, you, you could kind of explore oh, so with us. So what, I know, and that, we'll get to those in, in a moment, but maybe okay. you could just explore a little bit more about how the the visual design is constrained and and what does that the set of steps going into say the hijab for example how does it end up being exactly in that shape and form formation yeah. and who who's kind of getting the feedback when like yeah obviously there's somebody working with the digital file at some point in some set of resolutions how, who are they and where what are they yeah. designing within 
Yeah, so uh, let me, I'm going to bring you one of the funniest, uh, here it is. So the first thing I would point out is a lot of, all the different um, platforms have their different styles. Um, and I'm going to drop a link into the chat, which is one of my favorite like emoji, like kind of pieces ever, which is uh, an, an entomologist basically reviews all the different ant emojis <laughs> across all the different platforms. So that thing, if you guys you know, later on have a, um, have a chance to look at it, um, gives you a, a sense of the variety of aesthetics um, from, from the different platforms. So as a result, you know, they're kind of starting from different places. You know, Apple tend to be very realistic. I would say that Dumpling by far is one of the most realistic emoji that I've ever seen. Um, I mean, almost like you could eat it. Whereas something like uh, Microsoft is a very flat, you know, uh, very vectory kind of feel to their art. So, um, so let's, we'll start with that. That, that just like in, on, on some level, all the different platforms are constrained with like the look that they, they went for. So given that, emoji are square. So um, that's really tricky for certain things that really wanna be vertical or like horizontal. So for example, dosa is a, I think a, a, a very important Indian food. It is unfortunately kind of very long. <clears throat> So sometimes like hard, sorry was that, you know, which is a piece of clothing that's very, also very vertical, was very hard um, to, so oftentimes they'll try to put things on diagonals um, in order to kind of get the most like visual squareness um, out of it. So you'll see that with certain fruits and certain, um, certain pieces of clothing. But the, tr the trick is because of the, the forced squareness and like the forced dimension, sometimes things be, feel like kind of disproportionate relative to like another emoji. So like, you know, the cap emoji is relatively square. So it's like basically big, but like a coat emoji is like very vertical. So it's very small in, in proportion, you know, any, any kind of person who wore that hat and that coat at emoji sizes would have a huge head and a very small body. So, so that's, that's always constraint, sort of the, the squareness of it. Then there's like this whole thing of like, this is a more subtle debate. And I think we've basically moved, moved away from this, but like, um, you know, is a border, <laughs> do you have a hard border on, on you know, is it, is it a, a view into something, right? And so some of the emoji that you, we see that are nature related, like the desert and like there's a national park and there's like, sky and there's um, you know bridges they basically look like little pictures as opposed to like a, you know something like an apple or an animal that doesn't have you know isn't, isn't in something so so where this this happens to be weird there are animals where you kind of need them to be doing something with their environment to be clearly that animal so the sloth is an example like we have a sloth sort of hanging onto a branch that branch is like abruptly cuts off it's a little bit odd but like that's kind of sort of you know, point of least um at least conflict. The otter emoji is like floating on its back in water, for example, and that's also a little bit weird because it's like then the water kind of cuts off in emoji land. So, um, what we so so that that's sort of just like a, a tricky question. This is where cave had you know like the cave is sort of the absence you know of stuff, <laughs> and it's just while like there's so many great arguments for its cultural significance, its linguistic significance, and whatever, just like visually it was super tough. And until we sometimes if we can't solve the visual presentation, it um, it either is super delayed in getting through or it doesn't get through. Um, and like one of the you know kind of debates of late is there is a donkey emoji that was proposed, and the whole idea was like, do you do a whole donkey head? Then how do you differentiate it from a horse? Do you then make it floppy, you know, or do you like put some stuff on its back as a full body, or do you do nothing on its back? So there's this whole kind of thing of like how what how do you show a donkey? Um, so so that's that. So it used to be that like all the vendors did, went off and did all their designs and then came back and see like what people did, and so you end up with some inconsistencies uh, as a result of that. Um, I'm trying to think of one of the best examples of that inconsistency. Um, so the kneeling emoji, I when we did that propose, proposal, and it was you know, driven by an, an artist who was very much inspired by Colin Kaepernick, um, it is one knee. And for whatever reason, 
most of the um, platforms, with the exception of Google, have come back with someone kneeling on two knees, which has like a completely different connotation, right? One knee versus two knees. So that's sort of like inconsistent. Um, you know, there was like um, an inconsistency that they try to fix over time now, and you'll see, which is basically um, spiral eyes versus X eyes. So um, there was something called dizzy phase. And it doesn't actually tell you, like, for whatever reason, most people, most people, you know, in, in a good way, they draw dizzy faces having like spiral eyes and Apple decided to do with X's, which had made it look like it was dead, not, not like dizzy. And um, so as a result, one of the things that, um, you know, the, the committee tries to do is not to describe things in like an adjective kind of state, but to describe them literally. So, you know, um, you know, smiley face with X eyes, smiley face with spiral eyes, as opposed to saying like having someone interpret interpret that. So in recent years, they've done a better job of actually kind of like coordinating beforehand um, in terms of, um, you know, the there, there's email list of designers and they might discuss like, if we're gonna do this kind of, uh, you know, item from India, how are you guys gonna do it? Like what, what, cu what culture and all that kind of stuff. So, um, that I think has been better and less surprising when something's gone like slightly askew. So that that's basically what has happened. So it used to be kind of everyone did their thing and then it was like surprise and then they had to like spend all this time kind of fixing it. And now they try to like coordinate so that they're at least on the same page of like you know color or like you know what direction is facing. So direction facing is another thing that um, used to be inconsistent and they tried to be more consistent about that. And the the Unicode um you know uh approval process gives guidance images, right? So it's either the emoji that was submitted as part of the proposal, or um, we didn't quite like that one, we'll often have another artist like redo it. So um, in theory, they look at those, and, and uh, I would say in the past, some people paid more attention or less attention to those guidance images. And are you seeing at the level between Apple, Google, Microsoft and maybe some of the other uh, companies that have mm -hmm. uh, libraries. Are you seeing that there are conflicts in um, the way that this visual language is being developed? Is there are there stronger voices? Is you know is Google's approach resonating more with users, or is Apple's approach easier to yeah. you know to to communicate with? And how how is that interplay between the the corporate view yeah, affecting the ground level? Yeah, yeah. So, so the the difference in philosophies probably hit most on one thing, which is whether or not you apply skin tone to family emoji, right? So right now you can, you know, you can adjust all your hands. You can just basically you know, as an individual. Now we've let you do things with like two people or two two couples, um, but or uh, sorry, a couple with two two, two human two full body humans, um, but. Until we had developed that technology um, to have m more than one skin tone on one thing, uh, some platform, you know, I would say like one one platform, <laughs> one company in particular, is probably much more reputationally risk averse <laughs> than than almost all the others. So um, they, one of the the things is they didn't want it apply skin tone to anything that had more than one human in it. So like that's handshake, that's wrestling, that was the two dancing funny ladies because you can only apply one skin tone to the whole thing. So that means both people would have to be the same skin tone. And that would be like, that would kind of set, like imply that you could, it's like somewhat segregated. Like you would only wrestle with people or shake hands with people or dance with people that were the same skin tone as you. And they didn't want to make that send that message so they had no skin tone. So, so um, then we kind of helped like develop a process so you could have two skin tones in one emoji. And, and I think those, those, all of those slowly may, you know, with demand, all of those may get uh, double skin tone version. That being said, one of the harder by far, so hard, so hard areas of trying to do skin tones and gender are family emoji because you have so many combinations, right? You have like two parents, male, female, male, male, female, female, um, and then kids, which can be, you know, uh, uh, one kid, two kids, you know, one kid, two kids, you know, combination of genders. Then you have like one parent uh, family because so they were really upset that 
that like they were being represented by emojis. So I think all in all, when you start, you know, taking all the gender um, and whatever connotations you have, over 3,500 combinations. And that just like, it would be explosive and burdensome on the, um, on the, on, on a font, tech, on font technology, except, except, except for Microsoft, um, because all the other ones use, they literally like draw little pictures. And then when they see like, you know, the text encoding that like, oh, this is the, the family or, or whatever, they'll pop it in. Um, so they have just like these huge libraries of these little pictures ready to go to map. Um, Microsoft is different. They actually, I, I'm, I'm not like exactly sure how to describe it in the most accurate way, but they kind of draw the characters on the fly, right? And this is one of the advantages of having the vector approach because they basically say like, okay, it is this shape, it is a black, like it's, it's almost like they, they color like in a coloring book. So for them, it, it is not that much um, trouble to, to, if you have you know, a family of four, they can draw the colors in on the fly as they render it. And so they don't have to store all these pre-made images in this like vast way. And as a result, technically you can actually have interracial uh, family emoji in, in the Windows world. They, there's not necessarily a very good way to input it um, because just because, but um, if you look online, you can see the huge library, like you can cut and paste into your own kind of um, area. This is, this is true as of, um, you know, at least a couple of years ago, and I assume that it continues to be true now. But the fact that, that Microsoft has this different way of rendering fonts that's like more lightweight, and it's also partially because they're vector, very vector, very flat, and not like realistic looking, that they're able to do that. And so you, uh, so you have that. Then you have Facebook, um, who has no problem with having like a family that's like just all one color, like all black, you know, or all brown, um, you know, or all light brown. Um, whereas some of the other platforms feel very uncomfortable and implying that like families have to be one skin color. So you you see a split in both like how um, they've they have done that and just like the different attitudes of you know what what you know often marketing or like you know some kind of C level thing wants to say about race relations in the world. Yeah. Well and and I, I so appreciate that and then and just incredibly grateful for your work with this community to make the process more democratic to to create a, a you know a, a place for this debate to happen mm -hmm. to include the voices of people who might not be represented or might have visions for what could be improved upon or iterated upon or changed mm -hmm. to make it work better and that and then to manage those those very hard edges on the technical side I, I just, it's its so important to have people do that work. And I, I'm incredibly grateful. I think um, it'd be nice to, I guess, maybe end this this part of our pre-planned conversation, which mm -hmm. isn't really pre-planned mm -hmm. at all, um, with, with that, um, I guess, a, a meta question on how representation and communication is impacting Matter. democracy and how that the, the ways we communicate are, are as much a question yeah. of how we vote and how we um, engage in our political systems as they are in how we tell stories and... Um... Yeah. I, I do think that the introduction of skin tone was, was, was huge in the ability of different folks to communicate. I will also note that um, it's one, Katrina Parrott, who is a... a mother and entrepreneur out of Houston is the woman who is responsible for uh, bringing skin tones. I think no one had really brought it in front of the Unicode Consortium up until that point. So, um, and we kind of understood the, you know, the importance of it as Americans because we're really super obsessed with race and skin tones. Um, but when we, when my understanding talking to um, people who were there kind of at the time, when, when that proposal for skin tones was brought out of Unicode into the International Standards Organization, which again is sort of like the counterpart that, that takes an industry standard and kind of translates it into an international standard. Um, they, they were so puzzled why we needed skin tone, right? And um, even like the Sri Lankans, I would think like Sri Lankans would, or it was just like this huge pushback 
because in the original um, emoji, they came from Japan and they didn't have skin tones because in some ways like skin tone isn't a thing in Japan. The way that they sort of represented different people was this. So the Indian guy is the man with the turban. The Chinese guy is the one with the little cap. Um, the uh, Westernist is the blonde. And then just, there's just like everyone else, right? So you're basically Indian, Chinese, uh, blonde, <laughs> or, you're, or, or you're normal. And that, that was the Japanese way of seeing the world. And um, one of the ways that you can see sort of the importance of skin tone in terms of on the political discourse is very much in the distribution of, of um, the hand Let's see how they say this. The, the different emoji of hands are differently shaped in like the distribution of the skin tone to this color, for example. So like thumbs up, like, like the, the ones that skew more black, for example, as just, um, as you know, in terms of versus in the average generic um, like uh, hand gesture are thumbs up and then also fist raised, right? So the, the raised sort of like that fist is, is skews a little bit um, more towards the dark colors. And there has been academic studies that have been done on this. And that's like really fascinating, right? And I agree, like, you know, seeing a fist raised like this in a dark skin tone versus a light skin tone has like completely different um, connotations. So I think for a lot of people having this, at least definitely in America, maybe elsewhere in the world, but definitely in America, um, having the variety of skin tones feels, allows them to be more expressive politically and personally. So I think that's what, that's what I would say. And there's, you know, there's a lot of drama over flags that someone asked about in the chat. And I would say flags are like by far one of the most complicated and in areas that Unicode has to deal with on the emoji front. And it is like backing away like hard from it. Cause right now, um, to sort of indirectly answering a question that was a very long question, but I'll, I'll try to at least make an interesting point is that right now the Unicode Consortium can only recognize flags that are recognized kind of by the United Nations because like Unicode does not want to be in the business of deciding what it is and isn't a country. So, um, you know, and you, know, you can have things that are not quite nation states kind of like there and also. So Hong Kong, Taiwan, um, Palestine all have, have kind of recognition because in some ways they are, um, recognize as a, you know, from an economic perspective, because you have you know, different currencies, different whatever, they, they're, 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 they have, they have like standards mapped to um, those geographic entities, because you're like semi, they're, they're at least nation states, or they're, they function basically as nation states. That being said, um, there are a lot of really important flags that do not fall into a nation state kind of status. And the most um, important one is actually the Aboriginal flag, which is, recognized by Australia as an official flag, but doesn't map to a nation state. So there's no way for the you know, Australian Aboriginals to like set an, 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 a Unicode emoji at this point because there's just not yet. And so, you know, there's that, there are places like Kurdistan, you know, there are other countries that are trying to like fight for their independence. Um, and uh, it is it's, it's so hard, and and in in some ways there there has been so much kind of uh, discussion that this is not a problem that Unicode should solve. Like it is clearly a huge area of demand, and someone should try to figure it out. But it is you know it might be you know, something that then creates a standard that a Unicode can sort of apply. But they do not and uh, want to be in the business, nor should they be in in the business of deciding um, what is a uh, a, a, a geopolitically, you know, recognizable flag in the state of emoji. Well, and, and again, what I so appreciate and, and am inspired by is that you're exposing that interplay. You're by by advocating on behalf of inclusion and representation, and mm -hmm. and and showing what is behind the scenes in approval and, and you know and the process of <laughs> implementation is is definitely needed an emoji and it's needed in all of these other areas in technology in our lives that often what's going on is not known to the user it's layers right. and layers of complication bureaucracy. and technology and bureaucracy <laughs> right and, <laughs> yeah. and so there i think there's a um an underlying kind of structure here in what you're doing that can, that can be applied and is necessary for lots of other areas where technology is changing and our use of technology creatively and otherwise um, is impacting that. So um, mm -hmm. hoping that that 
you, you can create a framework through this that applies to yeah. other areas of emerging technology, which brings those things together. The, the you know, underlying users, the people who are re being represented, and then the, the constraints of the system in which that is operating. And um, gosh, it is awesome. So um, with that, I'm gonna go into the questions here. And we have a bunch uh, covering different areas. I know we addressed one or two, but um, a, a technical question to begin with, are there metadata tagged uh, tags embedded with each emoji? Yeah, so uh, I think the answer as asked is no. So an emoji, when it's usually like sent, is literally just a series of zeros and ones. Um, and then those zeros and ones are then like mapped to a character, you know, a character. So, so you know, when you're sending it between, uh, let's say your iPhone and then like it lands in Gmail on your laptop, the, those pictures in general are not the ones being sent. It's just a series of zeros and ones that then, you know, it, you know, uh, it looks like, and this is actually like a interesting thing, like the, um, Woman with funny ears. In in, ter in terms of when they consolidated all the different sets, one of the weird, weirder ones that kind of got mapped to each other, but actually aren't aren't are sort of the same, but not really the same, is that in the Apple version, it is uh, two women dancing full body. On the Google side, it is a portrait of a single lady with the funny ears. But those, you know, I can see why it got mapped together. So they look they and those have very different um, connotations, right? Because like. They both, well, they both have, you know, females and funny ears. So actually one of my favorite things is we, we in order to get gender parity, we did male with funny ears. And then the whole debate was like, well, what should they be wearing? Like, should they be wearing like other things? And we're like, no, they should be wearing the same exact thing. So they should be men and leotards with funny ears. Um, and it's still one of my favorite yes. kind of emojis. And um, actually, and so um, that being said, a bunch of everything in Unicode has defined properties that the kind of higher order operating system knows. So like the operating system knows that if it's Arabic, it likely has to go from right to left instead of left to right. You know, this idea that like, is this a, um, a like um, in English you have word breaks, in Chinese you don't have word breaks because there's no spaces between words, right? Like they're all the characters kind of like basically densely packed together. Um, you know, is there capitalization? Like there is no capitalization in Chinese, but there is capitalization in, you know, many other languages. Like how are the accents treated? Like are, is this, um, you know, are these uh, like, like um, double L in certain ways is, is uh, a single letter sort of treated as a single letter. So there, there, when, when you define a character, um, there are all these properties that kind of um, are, are set at the time that Unicode, you know, grants it. Uh, Unicode status. One of those um, actually is like, is it an emoji? Like, you know, has emoji representation or doesn't have emoji representation? And this one is, uh, it was, <laughs> yeah, retrospect, a mistake. But um, there are some characters that can be both like black and white. And then we, for whatever reason, we decide to emojify them. And that has decided that that is, has turned out to be a terrible uh, decision because the whole idea was like, oh, we already have a heart and a smiley face. And like, um, I think one of the I think one of the fingers, like in, in it was in, it, they existed as like wingdings or other kind of um, glyphs. And then they're like, oh, well, just like emojify them. And, and like, you just have to like turn on the tag of like emoji, you know, emoji presentation on or off. Turned out to be a terrible idea because um, actually in implementation, software engineers are not super careful about um, if things are rendered, you know, in emoji or not and paying attention to something that's you know on or off so like you would have these like kind of black and white documents by like academics and you read like colorful characters in it because uh you know something wasn't careful the uh, sometimes you'll see a bug i see it sometimes it's like the heart it's very common with the heart and very common with like the finger pointing that you think it's an emoji but it's like showing up as black and white and you're like what's that all about and it's because something something got messed up somewhere um but the so there's no metadata like actually in the one years as they're kind of like passing through, if that makes sense. But but you know, like over there, um, there is um, a whole set of attributes. I guess would be the good way to put it. There are a bunch of attributes for characters once you read in the one years. Great. Does that help? Mm -hmm. So uh, and moving here to the next question. Given that there are now many emojis, especially in the symbols section, 
that many people don't recognize or use often is their data tracking on how much an emoji is used and are yeah. they removed in that case if they're not being used? Yeah, so um, once an emoji, always an emoji. So never technically removed. Um, but that being said, the because uh, it'd be like removing like the letter capital letter B, you know, we're just going to get rid of it. So um, <laughs> um, that being said, there, what you see, what you see is a pictorial representation of the underlying code. So those numbers will never be uh, removed, uh, but the top level image can be changed, right? So the most, the most recent one is that our syringe emoji went from having blood drops to like no blood drops, right? Because precisely because we are, oh, so this would be actually a very good example um, to your earlier question of does, do the platforms react to popular culture? So like, you know, syringe emoji, relative, you have to say relatively obscure emoji for like most of its life. And then suddenly in like 2020, late 2020 and late 2021, like hugely relevant to, you know, um, the state of the world. And so they actually made it um, all the vendors remove the blood so that it can have a more generic meaning. So that's one. The other one that was really cute is um, it used to have the mask. There was, okay, first we have to like give it to the, the Japanese. We're having a mask emoji. Like in the very beginning of COVID, everyone was like texting me, not everyone, but like, you know, two or three people were texting me like, we need a mask emoji. And I, I sent them back like this one, the one that has been in the set from the very beginning because like Japanese like love masks. Um, and uh, it used to look slightly sad. If you look at older versions of the emoji, it's like, it's like it's sad. And now they've like, you don't want to give that connotation. So that emoji now is like happy. It's like happy while it's like wearing the mask. And the funny thing is um, if you change the font or you change the image associated with it, it doesn't just change it going forward. It changes it on all the past representations uh, that has ever been, right? Because it's, it's the underlying number is the same. It's just the, the font representation um, that has changed. But I'm gonna drop, um, I am going to drop a chart uh, that is the frequency data of various emoji up to certain generations. Usually the, the most recent generations are not included. But one of the most striking things is that the face with tears of joy is equal to basically 10% of all emoji sent, 9.9%. It's just, it's, it's very parallel. Like that single emoji is like 10%. Um, I don't know that will stand, you know, given that I guess people feel very boomer and like the Gen Z people are like, like we're, we're past that. Um, the second one is heart 6.6% and then um, heart eyes. And then the one that's sort of smiling. Um, actually, wait, you know what? I'm gonna, I'm gonna share. Share. I'm share. I'm just gonna share. Um, let's see. Can I share? You guys see? Do you see my? Do you, do you see? Like I have lots of windows. I'm gonna see. I'm gonna see my windows. Yeah, um, we just we just so, see your Chrome your Chrome window. Yeah. Okay. Um. So this one is nine point nine percent. Like that's huge, right? And then the heart. And then hard eyes, rolling face, smiley, thank you. And then it just like goes down and down and down. And so the way that they've done this chart is sort of by, um, it's very interesting. So it's basically um, the, the ones in level one, so, so zero, level zero by far the most popular. Right? And then the ones that are ranked one are basically about, um, an or they're, they're about half, half, um, half, the, half the frequency. Of, or half the popularity of, of zero. And then two is half the frequency of one. So therefore you know, one quarter of zero and then all the way down. So, so as you go down there, they, they exponentially get you know, less and less and less and less. So some are kind of interesting, like in terms of like, oh, here, do you see this? Do you see this guy, this black, this black and white one right there? That is an example of one of the emoji start, like um, was originally a black and white character they decided to emojify it and like you can see here it's, it's showing up as black and white which is sort of like a, a, a sign of it's um like <laughs> this is why they decided now it was a bad idea from a policy standpoint to just sort of randomly <laughs> emojify existing characters um and so you can see just even as a distribution flags tend to be very underused uh relative to uh, everything because there are so many of them and most people are not using most of them. They're using the one that they care about. So some countries obviously 
are not used all that much. Um, so it's sort of a nice kind of where your favorite emoji is, like your know, taco actually, surprisingly kind of low, but, you know, uh, but that's partially because it, it's probably popular in America. It's not even really a, a Mexican style tacos with hard shell, which is another debate that we've had in um, the emoji subcommittee. Uh, but it like, but you know, maybe not very popular in the rest of the world, so you know, relatively low. But I think what you see basically is that smiley faces and hearts uh, dominate. Oh, so here is actually that black and white heart that I mentioned. That it it, it shows up as black and white here, and here's a smiley face also as black and white. So these were originally things that were black and white characters. They're modified and they now look terrible in this chart, precisely because of the the consistency and fuzziness. Um, so flowers are also popular and like, I, I'm surprised that the, the monkey is not popular, but the dancing lady probably holds, holds its own. So you can, you can kind of get a sense of like, this is global and across all platforms. So, but, but, not but using, the most using recent. the Apple, using Apple's, uh, no, uh, library. Well, uh, no, this one is just happens because I'm on, on my devices. I'm, I'm on a Mac. So you're seeing, oh, okay. You're so it would show up. Yeah, it, right. Yeah. So this is like Twitter data. I think it's Twitter data, Apple data, Google data. There's one, hold on, maybe it wasn't Twitter. One one of them was late to the game and get it. I think this may not, one of the companies did not, like, it's, it's actually really hard to process the data. And so like one of the companies didn't get it done maybe <laughs> in time, or maybe it did get it done in time. But either way, um, it's also not, it doesn't incorporate the latest generation because it takes so long for some of those emojis to sort of propagate through the system that it would be unfair to sort of show them, um, right. you know, head to head in a year when they're not like they hadn't fully kind of been available on people's keyboards. So um, anyway, so that is, you know, that's emoji frequency. If you well, if you're if you're curious, you 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 too can like explore the relative <laughs> frequencies of your favorite or least favorite emoji. So um, maybe have time for to to address two more questions. A great question here on coming from a literature pers perspective, thinking mm -hmm. of emoji as pictographic language in mm -hmm. which it both expands vocabulary and restricts and limits language. Do emoji makers think of emoji as sitting within a lineage of pictographic languages? And can yeah. you speak to the, the sort of history of yeah. that ancient tradition and where, where that's coming into the... Um, yeah, so I can speak to it personally, which is a little bit different, like, you know, do the emoji makers think about this? So um, I actually have a good book that I co-authored coming out next year called Hanmoji, which compares like Chinese characters to emoji because the, there's so much that are that is in emoji radicals, I'm sorry, that is in Chinese radicals that are also very popular for emoji. So um, there are like, like, so I'll just do some sun. Um, Sun, moon, mountain, eye, mouth, hand, fish, um, tree, water. Like obviously these concepts were universal. If, if they kind of survived writing from, from like Chinese characters, you know, um, anywhere between two and 5,000 years ago. And then they're mirrored again in modern day language uh, or modern day emojis. There's a sort of universality to them as part of the human experience, I think is really interesting. Um, and, and so I very much think about, you know, having grown up learning Chinese and like the weird combinations of characters, for example, like a woman underneath a roof, you would, you're like, oh, that means like home or family or whatever. And it doesn't in Chinese, it's an, which means peace. So like things are at peace when your woman's at home, which I think is called, you know, then there is, um, good which is a woman with a child or like a, specifically I think a male child. So this idea of like our standard for good in Chinese culture back then was a woman who had a had, had like reproduced, which, um, you know, totally bothered me as like, a, you know, like a six year old girl learning my character. Um, and so we, we want to be very mindful in terms of how, um, uh, you know, in my world, like the subconscious sort of um, messaging that happens in emoji. And so that, that's why, we're just very careful about, um, you know, trying to be inclusive, trying to be representative. And, and you know, one of the, the funny things is like, you therefore have like um, 
you have gender neutral kind of introduced as a very, in, the, in terms of a very strong principle, because as you had introduced like male and female versions, they had to actually kind of make them more female, more male in order to make them differentiated. So that's why the, the man in many of the Apple cases, this is actually something I, I disagree with. They all have mustaches, which I think is like, like not great. It's like very 70s, Tom Selleck-ish. So um, they, they created a, a gender neutral kind of person. That just means person, right? And um, so like if we say the word doctor or teacher or um, you know pilot in English, there's no gender association with that. And, and if you had used emoji uh, before there was a sort of person person, you would have to choose a male or a female kind of um, to, if you were only going to represent one for like doctor. And the, the other place where this ends up being very uh, tricky is in German because they don't have like a gender neutral uh, term in many cases. And so um, it is a, it's been tricky sometimes to like come up with the word to describe the gender neutral human for different professions when they're translating all the emoji names into German, which I thought was fascinating. Um, so in terms of the, the linguistic representation, I, I think one thing I, I would point out in terms of just like a meta thing is like, I would, I would argue that emoji are the first truly digital, digitally native, like language isn't quite the right word because language always like beat up on me or anyone else for saying like emoji are a language because it's missing many features of a language, but like medium of communication um, because they're so colorful and so pretty and like, and there's so many of them and they, you select them through touch, right? It's like, it's the fact that we can have these devices and we can touch these devices that can create um, these characters. Whereas um, in most languages are spoken first and then maybe then mapped to a written form in order to convey the, the spokenness of it. But there's no spokenness of emoji, um, which I think is really fascinating. And, and one of the weirder places for lack of spokenness in emoji land is there's no way to say I and there's no way to say you, which are in any spoken language, one of the most fundamental principles of like what is to be said, but not in emoji because, you know, sometimes you're not, they, so you see people struggling to say like I or to say you in um, through digital representation. Well, so. I think that is a, a great place mm -hmm. to wrap up and, and a challenge for mm -hmm. all of the future emoji designers mm -hmm. and, and users as, as to how to address that. And I think those, those types of questions really do um, resonate in, in the design and creative community so much because it is about how do you represent visually that, mm -hmm. that position or that perspective or what, from where do you look or where do you read or where do you center mm -hmm. a narrator or a perspective? And right. um, well, Jenny, thank you thank so you. much. <laughs> this was brilliant and covered such a, a wide range of, of questions and areas and um, really, really inspiring stuff. So yeah. I uh, yeah. and we invite you to come to Art Center when, whenever you want to, to engage the students <laughs> to maybe meet, meet some of our community who are, who are working in, in the visual design of the space. And um, for any of those that want to get in touch with you directly, is it best to reach out through Emoji Nation? I think there were yeah. a few folks that wanted yeah, or to you um, can, follow up yeah where you can email me and i'm also happy if you guys you know i don't know if you guys are quite in person yet because i know it varies all around the world but i'm happy to do a screening of the documentary and do q a and some of the people may even be able to zoom in because i think that gives, that gives a pretty good lay of the land on the issues of emoji and and adobe can sponsor it. adobe gave us a bunch of um basic uh, sponsorship to do education and museum screening we would love to take you up on that and, <laughs> um, and to try to do it in person when we are back on campus yeah. at the start of, <laughs> of 2022. So that would be great. Yeah, and yeah. Thank you so much. And um, don't be a stranger and we'll see you whenever we're here again. Yeah. And, um, thank you to everybody who was here today, Gloria and the HMCT team. Um, and then for everybody who's continuing on through Creative Tech Week, our next session for the general public starts at one o'clock. Uh, and that's with B.D. Wolf, and it's uh, covering speculative studio and creative practice um, in, a, in a really interesting way. B.D.'s work is a, as a musician, an artist, designer, technologist, 
And uh, we hope to see you there. And then final session today at 4 p.m. with um, our, our great set of uh, faculty and alumni speakers. So hope to see you for that. And thank you very much, Jenny. And thank you, thank you to everybody out in the, in the Zoom land. We'll see you next Bye. time. Bye.